So this story starts around two years ago in my coffee shop in Bath in England, uh, which is called Colonna and Smalls. We would describe ourselves as a specialty coffee shop. And something happened. Coffee that should taste good tasted bad. Now, the idea of our shop is to serve the best possible coffee we can and to engage with customers in a dialogue about this coffee. We can only achieve that if we consistently deliver quality, of course. And so we put a lot of things into place, a lot of processes, and we try and improve these all of the time. They start with our staff. They're all full-time. We have no part-timers. And they're looking to pursue a career in this industry. Then there's the equipment. How can we make the most of technology at this moment in time to produce the best coffee? None of this matters, of course, if the suppliers we use don't provide us with a quality ingredient. We're a multi-roaster. And over the years, we've built up relationships with roasters, people who share our taste aesthetics, our ideas of quality. Uh, I'm getting carried away, though. This failed. It completely did not work. That coffee tasted awful. Not just flat or uninspiring, but unservable. And so we frantically rushed around to try and solve this problem. We looked at all of our variables. We used a refractometer. We looked at the age of our burrs. We cleaned them. Everything we had control of in store. Nothing. There was no reason. So naturally, we blamed the roaster. And we, we sent them some coffee, and we said, what do you think of this? We think it tastes dreadful. Obviously, they were quite upset and frantically went about tasting the coffee themselves. To my surprise, about uh, two days later, they phoned me up, and they said, no problem, it tastes brilliant in our cupping lab. Now, it would be easy at this point to think that this was just a difference of opinion, the subjective element that plagues the industry. But I've tasted coffee with these people a lot. And we may not agree on, on what the most perfect coffee in the world is, but we do agree on basic ideas of quality. Moreover, we definitely agree on what tastes bad. So we shared all of the information that we both had about the way we brewed and prepared the coffee, and still nothing. But could it be something else, something we couldn't see, something that's invisible? Could it be the water? Now, this isn't to say that we hadn't discussed the water. In fact, we'd used standard measurement devices and language within the industry to do this, which is something called TDS, which stands for Total Dissolved Solids. It's quite a simple concept. Water, in its purest form, distilled or deionized, is just H2O. But it goes on many journeys around the world, and it picks things up. A lot of the time, we filter a lot of the bad things out, dirt and copper. But most water has a mineral content of some kind, and this registers as a TDS. We use a number, which is milligrams a litre or parts per million. The idea is that anything over around 200 we would deem as being hard, possibly, and anything under 100 we would often describe as being soft. There were some questions here, though. What, is a 200 in one location the same as a 200 in another location? We were pretty sure that water was the culprit, but we didn't know why or how, and we didn't have enough knowledge or understanding. So how do we solve this problem? Well, luck would have it that Bath University in England is host to a thriving scientific academic community, and a lot of those fellows like to drink coffee, and they like to drink it in our shop. One of them in particular, Christopher H. Hendon, is a computational chemist. This means he tests theories and models using the power of supercomputers. He wandered in one morning, and I thought, I bet Chris will be interested in this. So I said, hey, Chris, I'm really concerned about the water I'm brewing my coffee with. This number, this TDS number, what does it tell me? And he said, uh, well, what do you want to know? I said, the idea is that the number tells me what the coffee should taste like, and that if that number is the same here in another country or another town, we're making the same coffee. He giggled a little and said, uh, that's ridiculous. And... Um, as you'll see very shortly, the mineral composition that makes up that number is vitally important. Not only is there a problem with the number, it's very loose, it doesn't tell us that much, but the common device we use, uh, an ionic conductivity meter, is uh, very flawed. So um, I don't know how many people are familiar with these. They're quite cheap. They just have two little metal points. And the idea is that that little device measures how, how much movement there is between those points. So the more minerals in the water, the more movement, so the higher the number. The problem, however, is that calcium moves faster than magnesium, and chlorine moves about as twice as fast again, which means if you had water, one with calcium, one with magnesium, one with chlorine, and you had technically the same amount of each in each, the number would be dramatically different. But let's imagine that 
we could measure the TDS accurately and that the number was accurate. Does that still tell us what we need to know? No. But what do we need to know? OK, so we need to delve beyond TDS. And we need to talk about three characters in the water story. That's calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. And to understand their roles, we need to understand two concepts. The first is binding energy. Uh, this is pretty cool. So minerals, like calcium and magnesium, have the ability to bind strongly to flavors in our coffee and pull them into the drink. This is what we mean by binding energy. And they're the only two we really care about in the water. One of the scientific papers we did was looking at the binding energy of typical minerals we find in drinking water. Something like sodium, for example, has no more of an impact on our extraction than the water itself. Therefore, if the sodium's there, we don't extract any flavor we wouldn't otherwise. If we had too much sodium, of course, it would start to taste salty. But calcium and magnesium stood out head and shoulders above the rest. Interestingly, they also had slightly different preferences in terms of what they bound to. Magnesium tends to bind to fruitier, sharper compounds like citric and malic acid, whereas calcium tends to bind more strongly to heavier, rounder, creamier flavors. But the point is, they both extract a lot, which means water without these minerals in them will extract very different flavors to water with these minerals in them. In many ways, though, what me and Chris were doing here was exploring something in more depth that the coffee industry already took as gospel. I was told very early on when I got into coffee that I didn't want to use distilled water because there was no minerals, so we couldn't pull out the flavor we wanted. And effectively, this was a great experiment where we learned more about that already understood idea. But we still couldn't solve our mystery, and something that still made no sense to me whatsoever was hard water. Okay, so if minerals help us pull more flavor out, hard water has more minerals. So the cup of coffee we make should taste fuller, more vibrant, complex. The complete opposite happens. The coffee tastes flat, dull, chalky, and bitter. And that's where the last part of the puzzle comes in, the bicarbonate. Today I'm going to describe bicarbonate as the buffer, because this really nicely describes its role in coffee. Uh, here in the States, you might be used to calling bicarbonate alkalinity. It's got many different names. We can also call it carbonate hardness. Now, let's explain what it does. Buffering is integral to life on planet Earth. Take human blood, for example. Our blood likes to sit between a pH of 7.25 and 7.45. If we pop outside of this, we're in trouble. And so, buffering systems are there to keep pHs constant. Not neutral, necessarily, just where they need to be. And they do this in the most fascinating way. It's going to get a little bit sciencey now, but this bit is worth understanding. Everything makes sense when we understand the buffer. So what the buffer can do is turn a compound into something called its conjugate partner. Now, nearly all compounds, whether they be acidic or alkaline, have a conjugate partner. It's basically an altered state of itself. Take citric acid, for example. Day to day, going about its business, citric acid is an acid. But if the buffer comes along and knocks off the proton, suddenly it's an altered version of citric acid. It's the alkaline version of citric acid. But what does all of this mean for coffee? Well, coffee is a mildly acidic beverage. It tends to have a pH of around 5. But the brewing water that we started with was most likely not mildly acidic. It was most likely closer to neutral. So we've got a problem. The minerals, calcium and magnesium, are helping us extract compounds into the beverage, most of which are mildly acidic, and we like the flavor of a lot of those acids. The buffer, though, has no interest in what we find tasty. Its goal is to keep the pH where it was, so it goes out of its way to undo all of the hard work we did with calcium and magnesium. So in essence, that deceptively non-acidic cup of coffee has plenty of acid in it, it's just that it's organized in a way that we cannot taste it. Which brings me on to a key notion in the way we understand water and coffee. We need not look at it as an ingredient. For example, a lot of people say to me, I found this water that I really like, I think it's really tasty, and I'm going to brew some coffee with it, because tasty plus tasty equals really nice. Um, <laughs> but by the time we make a cup of coffee, we no longer taste the flavor of that water at all. It is gone. There is a lot more coffee in there. What we do taste is the way that water did its job as an extractor and flavor carrier. So we were able to solve that mystery at the core of our story at the beginning. The coffee 
was roasted very differently because it was roasted to the water at the roastery, not at our shop. Which brings me on to a story. This is one of my favourite stories. You're probably thinking by now, this is going to affect everybody everywhere. And this story starts in Canada, in Calgary. There is a roastery called Phil and Sebastian. And every year, they send some coffee off to Mad Symposium in Copenhagen. And Mad Symposium have a coffee offering where they do a blind tasting and pick the coffees that they think are the best. Anyone from around the world can send their coffees in to be blind judged. Every year, Phil and Sebastian's coffee was not chosen. Now, obviously, this is disappointing, but that's not what was confusing them. What was confusing was the feedback they got. Now, when Phil and Sebastian started roasting, before this, they were engineers, you see, uh, they were greatly inspired by the man in the front row here, Tim Wendelbow. And they went to visit him and tasted some of his coffees. And when they went back to Canada, they realized what they were roasting was quite different to maybe what was being roasted there at the time. So they described themselves as Scandinavian-style roasters, light, aromatic, bright coffees, maybe slightly less body, very clean. But the feedback they got from the symposium is that their coffees were not this at all. Their coffees were dull, flat, a bit roasty. This made no sense to them. I caught up with Phil in Rimini last year at the World Barista Championship, and he said to me he was pretty sure it was the water, and we had a chat about it. And what he went away and did was really clever. He went and found out what the typical water spec that they were brewing those coffees with for that symposium. And he went back to Calgary, and he made the water, started with some deionized or some distilled water, and did what people who make beer have been doing for a long time. He added the minerals to mimic that water. He then roasted his coffee to this water. Now, this is a very important notion. I don't think, for the roasters I've spoken to around the world, that they realize how much they're roasting their coffee to their given water. They buy some coffee that they think is exceptional. They test roast it. They develop their roasts and tweak their roasts. Maybe it's taste underdeveloped, too acidic, too sharp, not enough sweetness, whatever it may be. All the while, they are developing their coffee to taste as best it can with that water, the water in their quality control room or cupping table. But the coffee doesn't stay there for very long. Most coffee companies now are working across huge, vast distances, and their coffee is being consumed by many people in many areas with many different waters. So anyway, you probably guessed the end of this story, which is last year, for the first time, Phil and Sebastian's coffee was chosen to be presented at Mad Symposium off the blind cupping table. A new understanding about water raises many questions, much more than it answers. And these two concepts, to me, are fascinating. On the one hand, you have the idea of water terroir. This is a romantic notion. It's this idea that different waters in different places feed into the rabbit hole of coffee, the rich tapestry that makes up the coffee world. Uh, it's a nice idea, but I, I don't like it at all. Um, I'm interested in the terroir of the coffee. I am not interested in the terroir of the water. And I think most people in coffee would agree. But standardization itself is also very difficult. Different water sources here in Seattle, very, very, very soft water. And wherever you are around the world, you're going to need different solutions. And it's easier to say, let's standardize water than to actually do it. The impact's huge, though. Think about it. Um, a capsule system, for example, which I think over here you call pod systems, are becoming very popular. And the goal is that the consumer buys the unit, and they buy a little pod with some ground coffee in it that's hermetically sealed. They're not just buying this because it's more convenient. They're buying it because the idea is that a lot of the variables that hinder quality have been controlled. But this is a massive illusion. After the coffee itself and the way it was roasted, water is definitely the next biggest impact on the way the coffee tastes. And these companies are not controlling that ingredient. This is in stark contrast to other products you'll find on a supermarket shelf, such as beer or whiskey. Many of the time, we will actually embrace this element of the process. We'll talk about the special water we use to make the whiskey or to make the beer. That's all fine if the water is in the bottle on the shelf, not if it's a wild card ingredient added at the point of brewing. Take the World Barista Championships, for example, that are happening this week in Seattle. I'm thrilled to be representing the United Kingdom, but I'm also slightly concerned about the water. In previous years, whether it be in Bogota or Tokyo or London, if TDS was the metric that we used, this was the tool we used to decide whether the water was okay, 
We didn't know enough about the water. We were under an illusion that we were creating an even playing field wherever we were going. But the whole point of this competition is that competitors from over 50 countries have gone against the odds, really, to win their national competition, which is hard to do. And then we come together to pursue excellence and hopefully hold a mirror up to our industry and, and be a part of its evolution in some way. But how even is that playing field? How fair is that competition? I believe the only way that the World Brewers Championship should provide water is to make it like Phil did. Phil was able to find a common platform with those people tasting his coffee in Copenhagen. And I think when all those barista competitors around the world prepare for this World Championship, they should be on the same platform. We should turn up not worrying about the terroir of our water, but being excited about the terroir of our coffee. So that's the end of this story, but the beginning of many more. A new understanding and a new focus means change. The age of the TDS meter in regards to water measurement is over, and the time of precise mineral composition is here. Water has stepped out of the shadows and into the spotlight, and its impact on every facet of coffee's sensory experience cannot be denied. Thank you.